this episode of Trek in Time, we're going to be talking about evil beards. <laughs> or the lack or none. <laughs> of evil beards. That's right, folks. You've dropped into the mirror universe where Matt and I <laughs> are indistinguishable from one another. <laughs> For those who cannot see me, I am now beardless. And if you could not see me, you probably didn't even know I had a beard. So what do you care? Who cares? <laughs> but for those of you on YouTube, get used to seeing a lot of these chins. <laughs> Sean. And of course, I'm mentioning this all as like the mirror universe falling into a different dimension where... Facial hair is a good indicator of motive because we're talking about Enterprise Season 4, Episode 18 and 19. That would, of course, be In a Mirror Darkly, Parts 1 and 2. That's right, folks. If you didn't check out both episodes and you want to keep up with our conversation, you should go back and watch Part 2 as well because we will be discussing both. That's what we do here on Trek in Time, where we watch every episode of Star Trek in chronological order and put it into context in the original era in which it was broadcast. So we're taking a look at Enterprise. We are amazingly, like this Very close. season suddenly zipped by, and perhaps it's because yeah. we took our viewer, listener feedback of, hey, when you guys have a two-parter, do it as a single episode, suddenly zip. We've only got a few episodes left before we're done with Enterprise and we'll be moving on to Discovery. And who are we? Well, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a published author. I'm a writer. I write some stuff for kids. I write some sci-fi. And with me is my brother, Matt. He's that Matt of Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Still getting used to looking at a beardless brother. but <laughs> Yeah. Now you know the pain I've been in for years. Oh. Ooh, was... beer burn. <laughs> As usual, before we move on to our discussion for this current episode or episodes, we'd like to share some feedback from previous episodes. So Matt, what do you have for us? Oh, related to beards from Technophile One. Next week will be will be evil bearded Matt and shaven shaven freedom fighter Sean. Pretty close. <laughs> he got yeah. he got half of that right. <laughs> yeah. The other comment was from that I wanted to bring up is the dude who's commented a bunch of times. I'm half expecting to see some registration NX01 merch one day. <laughs> when that would be that, bad. I was like, we, yeah. we really should make that. <laughs> yeah. It should just be a t-shirt that says, just says registration NX01. Registration NX01. <laughs> no further clarification needed. Yeah. And the last comment I want to kind of bring up is giant hogweed lives. He commented on episode 89, Affliction and Divergence, and he wrote, this two-part Klingon arc was very good Star Trek. I doubted you during season one when you said Enterprise would get better, but you were right. However, I'm glad the Zindi stuff is over. Now, I find I find that comment funny because it's like, yeah, we weren't lying. It gets better. But I would actually say the Zindi part is my favorite part. Mm. But I do think like basically seasons was it three and four are where the show kind of gets overwhelmingly good yeah. more than bad. <laughs> it's the first two seasons where it's like Ugh. <laughs> some real doozies. Yeah, I agree. I think that it's really interesting to think in terms of season three being where it found its footing, but season four is where it really yeah. started to feel like it was Star owning Trek. the Star Trekness of itself. Yep. Because yep. we have episodes like these, we have the episodes where they use Klingons and Andorians <clears throat> and Tellarites, and it doesn't feel like fan service in the same way it did in the first season when they would bring mm -hmm. out a Klingon and it would just be like you're over dependent on the fan base knowing who these people are as opposed to showing mm -hmm. us character development of these alien species but in season four they're really hitting those marks really well i think this episode is another one where they show a demonstration of the trekness of it all because this one has as we get into our discussion there are so many threads that they are pulling together in really sometimes very fascinating and sometimes unintentionally funny ways, but I think it all is very Trekish as we're, as we're uh, watching this one. So we'll get mm -hmm. into that in a moment, but before we do that noise in the background is of course the read alert. And as usual, it means it's time for Matt to buckle up and read the Wikipedia description. And I'll give you and everybody listening a warning. 
I went with the full synopsis that they called the synopsis, the summary from Wikipedia, because there's some interesting nuggets in here. So it goes a bit beyond what is happening in the particular episodes. It gives kind of a bigger picture review, and it's also rather long. So Matt, you might want to take a sip of water, gargle a little bit, do some me, 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 ma, ma, mo, ma, 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 and get ready to, that's right, some blow some raspberries okay. and get ready because yep. you're going to be reading for a little bit. So. Take it away. All right. In a mirror darkly is in a mirror darkly is the 18th and 19th episodes of the fourth season of the American science fiction television series, Star Trek Enterprise and originally aired on April 22nd and 29th, 2005. This installment was developed to be a sequel to the original series episode, the Tholian web and a prequel to mirror mirror. The decision to set an enterprise episode in the mirror universe originated with a pitch to enable William Shatner to appear in the series. Wow. The teleplays for both parts of the episode were written by Mike Sussman and Manny Koto, contributing the story for the second part. Set in the 22nd century, the series normally follows the adventures of the first Starfleet, Starfleet Starship Enterprise Registration NX-01. However, these installments feature a mirror universe, Jonathan Archer, and evil counterparts of the normal characters who serve the cruel and militaristic Terran Empire. In the first part, the ISS Enterprise... ISS? Yeah, the ISS Enterprise learns of a Starfleet ship from the future of the main universe, which is being stripped for parts by the Tholians and seeks to take the ship from the aliens. The second part of the series, the surviving crew operating the USS Defiant and seeking to overthrow the Empire using its advanced weaponry. The episode saw the reuse of footage from Star Trek First Contact and the creation of an alert alternative opening credit sequence, which included footage from the other Paramount properties, such as the film The Hunt for October. <laughs> a three quarters around bridge from the original series era was constructed, as well as other sets from a Constitution class starship. A Gorn and a Tholian were both created using CGI with the Gorn using motion capture techniques. And this installment also saw the return of Von Armstrong as Admiral Maxwell Forrest after his main universe character was killed on screen earlier in the season in the episode, the forge, this episode subsequently appeared in several lists of the best episodes of star Trek enterprise. It was nominated for an Emmy award for outstanding hairstyling <laughs> for a series in 2005. I like that. That's its credit for success. Yes. Hairstyling. That's right. <laughs> and because I knew there would be people who would be asking who won for outstanding hairstyling for a series in 2005? Well, it would be Deadwood the movie. Other nominees included <laughs> Mad TV, Enterprise, of course, Alias, American Dreams, and Carnival. So this episode, as Matt has just mentioned, season four, episodes 18 and 19, directed by James L. Conway for part one, Marvin Rush for part two. Marvin Rush, interestingly, was a director of photography for many episodes of Enterprise. He had not directed himself. As James Conway was directing part one, Rush watched carefully as to the choices he would make because his goal was to make his episode that he would be directing seamless. He didn't want it to look like they were directed by two different people. I think he did a remarkable job because as I watched these two parts, it never occurred to me that there was a different person at the helm. Mm-hmm. Written by Michael Sussman for part one, story by Manny Cotto for part two, with the teleplay being written by Sussman. The original air dates were April 22nd and 29th, and guest appearances include Von Armstrong as Forrest once again, Frank Ross as the Grizzled Man, Carolyn <laughs> Bel Belskis as the Montana Earth Woman. These are, of course, <laughs> these are the, the background from Lifted from First Contact. These are, that's yep. what those references are. Gary Graham as crewman Saval. This is of course, ambassador Saval, but in the mirror universe, he is just a crewman. Gregory Itson as Admiral Black, John Mahone as Admiral Gardner, Derek Magyar as Ensign Kelby once again, but this is the mirror universe Kelby. So instead of seeing a, I'm put out by trip, taking my job, Kelby, we're seeing a, oh, I'm sorry, sir. Kelby. <laughs> and interesting note here, Magil Barrett yep. as the computer voice, her appearance here would make her the only actor to have been in every iteration of Star Trek up to this point. <laughs> so what was the world like at the time that this landed 
This is, of course, April 22nd and 29th, 2005. Matt, I know you'll recall this because you were singing until your voice was hoarse and your vocal <laughs> cords were bleeding since you've been gone by Kelly Clarkson it was the number one song both weeks. And at the movies, people were lining up to see in the first week, Amityville Horror, which is the 2005 remake of the classic horror film from the 70s. This edition starred Ryan Reynolds, Melissa George, Phil Hall, and it featured the debut of a young actress named Chloe Grace Moretz. And the following week, the number one movie was The Interpreter. The Interpreter is the 2005 political thriller directed by Sidney Pollack, starring Nicole Kidman, Sean Penn, Catherine Keener, and Jesper Christensen. It is the first film shot inside the United Nations, as well as the final feature film directed by Pollack. And for people who might not be familiar with Pollack, Pollock directed more than 20 films and 10 television shows. He acted in over 30 movies and produced 44 films. He won Best Director and Best Film for Out of Africa in 1985. He was also nominated for They Shoot Horses, Don't They? in 1969 and Tootsie in 1982. He is a remarkable filmmaker. So if people are not familiar with his work, I do strongly recommend going back and revisiting his films. And on television, without getting into too much detail about both weeks, I'll just share that it, it continues to be sad days for Enterprise, continuing mm -hmm. to bump along at the low end of the viewership, being beaten or paired by weak networks such as the WB, what I like about you and Reba getting roughly the same sized audience as Enterprise. And the big winners continue to be ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox as they are showing things like America's Funniest Home Videos, CSI, Friday Night Movie on Fox, and Dateline NBC. This would be an in another interesting footnote. During the production of this episode, Matt and I were talking last week where I was speculating, I bet by now the network knew Enterprise would not be returning. It would be during mm -hmm. the production of these episodes that the cast and crew would find out that Paramount was canceling the series series. So probably a bit of a difficult and mixed emotional time in shooting these. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say that I could see it in the performances, but there's certainly an aspect to sending the show off at this stage while doing this kind of episode might have had some mixed emotions because they're not doing straight up enterprise. They're doing a take on enterprise. And I wonder mm -hmm. what that was like for them. And in the news, the biggest news from these weeks was the selection of a new Pope. <clears throat> pope John Paul II had passed away and Benedict XVI would be selected as his replacement. He was 78 at the time of his selection. So there goes the Catholic Church looking for young blood. He was selected in 2005 and he would serve as Pope until he would step down resigning in 2013. He would be the first Pope to do this since lead to the ascension of our current Pope, Pope Francis, who is currently, as of the time of this recording, being hospitalized. hospitalized. He himself is not doing well health-wise. So on to our discussion of this episode. Right out of the gate, we start off with a reuse in the cold open of shots from first contact in which we see the post Zephram Cochran flight drawing yeah. the attention of Vulcans who land in Montana emerge and it is straight out of the film. It's the Vulcan stepping down, removing his hood, revealing the famous ears. Zephram Cochran steps forward. The Vulcan gives the Vulcan hand sign of peace and long life. And Zephram Cochran pulls out a shotgun and blows his head off. So right <laughs> out of the gate, we know something's different. And the grizzled yeah. man in the background yells out, get on that ship and grab everything you can. Yep. The implication being here that not only are these humans somehow able to overpower well-armed Vulcans, they yep. are able to somehow figure out how all this technology works. Yep. And this would be the emergence of the 
empire in the yep. mirror universe, which is humans dominating do, all do, of space. Do we want to just like pause and talk about the plot just for a minute and just give our general assessment as to like whether we liked this, enjoyed it, didn't? What what are what our feelings were? I absolutely invite you to what? start off. No, I was gonna say you go first. You go first. Okay. Because I usually go first. You go first. I think that one of the first things that struck me was I was glad to finally have a opening credit song that I could sit through yes. and enjoy the historical references having been the imagery being turned dark was a nice twist, but the song itself, I actually found pleasurable. I think that these are two episodes that are incredibly well made. They are incredibly mm -hmm. well thought out. The goal that they were going for is both fascinating from a or the origination of the idea and to the final result i found really uh, intriguing i find a lot of the scenes compelling and i like the fan service elements of it mm -hmm. but ultimately this felt like one of the biggest <clears throat> pieces of fan fiction you've ever seen it mm -hmm. doesn't feel at a certain level and it's interesting because in looking back at the review of the show at the time of broadcast, this, this got very, very high marks. Mm -hmm. I can understand why, but now in the context in which we are now, I have mixed feelings about it because I found it to be, I, one of the elements of this that I do really like is the fact that it is completely self-contained and it is not about any of the characters from the main universe falling into the mirror universe. I like that. I like that it is effectively fan fiction -y in the form of we've been showing you for several seasons, what's going on, how the original, uh, enterprise came about and what its first adventures were like and how it led to the formation of the Federation. I kind of like the fan fiction element of like, what was the mirror universe like of this at this time? So giving us that in this way, I preferred that it wasn't some sort of ham fisted Archer goes back in time or right. into the mirror universe. My research, I discovered what the original plot would have been. And if you want me to go into that, I can, yeah, it ahead. was originally, it was originally going to be, this was going to be a tie in not to the Tholian web episode, which is what they end up doing with this. And I think that the tying in of mirror mirror and the Tholian web together is brilliant because the Tholian web episode of the original series had nothing to do with the mirror universe. It had to do with the enterprise coming across the USS defiant, which is trapped inside a Tholian web and was leaving our reality. It was leaving, it was going into another dimension. They couldn't understand what was happening. A team beams aboard the ship and when they come back, Kirk has to stay behind on the ship and he ends up getting pulled into the alternate universe along with the ship. And through a series of events, Spock is able to figure out what's happened and is able to pull him back. Using that as a jumping off point for this episode of Enterprise, I think is really mm -hmm. kind of brilliant saying not only was it a trap set by the Tholians, it was a time element was involved as well. Yeah. So you have this time travel aspect. I really like the idea that for the mirror, you excuse me for the mirror universe, it would be reconstructing technology that they did not develop that would lead to the human empire at the time of mirror mirror. Yeah. So this is a technology that they don't develop and they may not fully understand how to improve upon it. I like the idea that the the strength of the hum, of the human empire at that point is based on stolen future tech. So and it creates then the implication being that the humans of that mirror mirror episode aren't able to improve upon it, which is another element as the mirror universe continues to be used in other Star Trek series in the future. I'm thinking particularly DS9 where right. Humanity at that point is struggling and it's because the technologies and the weaponry that they were dependent upon was something that they didn't fully understand. 
So I like that aspect of it as well. But originally this was going to be tied in directly with the mirror mirror universe. And I'll try and give as brief a synopsis as I possibly can. In mirror mirror, there's good Kirk and evil Kirk. Evil Kirk is referred to in the fandom as Tiberius to separate him from James T. So the episode where it ends with bearded Spock saying, I will consider what you say about one man being able to make a difference. And the device that the evil universe uses to what looks like disintegration, the writer of this episode Sussman proposed the idea of what if that's not a disintegration device, it's a teleportation device and it's shooting people back in time into the main universe that the people who are using it don't understand that that's what it's doing, but it's depositing people back in the past. Mm -hmm. So the proposal was what if we do an episode of enterprise in which when evil Kirk Tiberius went back to his universe evil Spock puts him in that device, teleports him, but where the beings are teleported is to the main universe in the past on a penal colony. So the enterprise then runs across that penal colony and finds now older, angry Tiberius who wants to get back to his own universe. The story was going to be that back and forth. The story originated, the idea originated from William Shatner who at this point had with Gabriel Reeve Stevens and his wife, let, let me make sure I mentioned both of them, Judith Reeve Stevens and Garfield Reeve Stevens had been writing a series of books which were official Star Trek novels, but they are jokingly referred to. They never had this as an official title. They're referred to as the Shatnerverse. They followed after generations and they tell the story. And you want to talk about like, really bending into a mirror universe or fan fiction after generations, the books include the story of Spock going to the grave where Picard had buried Kirk. And then the story goes back in time and shows Kirk in his unease of retirement. And then at the end of the story, it returns to Spock at the gravesite. And he witnesses what looks like a space battle with Federation phaser fire and green <clears throat> phaser fire. And then the grave site, something is teleported out of the grave site and the rocks tumble inward on themselves. Kirk's body is stolen. The following book, that was the end of the first book. The next book follows how the Romulans in a alliance with the Borg <laughs> have stolen Kirk's body reanimate it, <laughs> return oh, its katra, but corrupt oh, it so that Kirk hates oh, the God. Federation to use him as a tool to undo oh, the Federation. It is wild. The synopses of fiction. these books is wild. And they were published under the author's name, William Shatner. William Shatner was involved in coming up with the stories and was the author of record, even though they were being written by the Reeve Stevenses. Right. These are the books that the Reeve Stevenses were writing before they started writing for enterprise. So now we have Shatner coming up and saying to the producers of enterprise, I would like to be, I'd like to be in this and here's how he proposed it. So it was going to be a time travel story where evil Kirk from the mirror universe is teleported back to the main universe on a penal colony that the mirror universe is using whenever they use that disintegration device. It's actually a teleporter. Enterprise would meet evil Kirk. Evil Kirk would work with Archer. There would be some sort of conflict with him trying to use the teleporter to get back to his universe. And it would be, and here's the final okay. part of like the fan fiction -y part of it. Evil Kirk would discover that his universe does not exist yet. It is through the actions with the enterprise okay. that they would create the mirror universe. Okay. All of that is just so much like what? 
So I, then we end up with these. These are what happened I, because Shatner and the producers couldn't reach an agreement about his involvement. So Sussman came up with the idea of what if we tie this in with Atholian Web and do this instead? Okay. So here's my feelings on this episode. That would have been a more interesting episode. <laughs> I do not begrudge anybody that enjoys these episodes. I hate these. I hate them. I was so bored. I was just like, this is, it just felt like I was watching fan fiction that had no place in everything we've been watching before. It had, because it had no direct tie to the show we've been watching four seasons of, like you didn't have a character going back in time or ending up in that universe, or there was no kind of like bridge. It was just, oh, we're just in the mirror universe watching this stuff happen. I didn't care. I didn't care about anybody because everybody's evil. Everybody deserves to die. Everybody, it's like, oh, they're just all stabbing each other in the back. I don't find that kind of thing enjoyable. And then on top of which, my logic brain would not shut down. And right from the opening sequence, I was like, yeah, a bunch of basically, you know, street people. Able to figure out how, yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, you're going to overpower the Vulcans. And then you're going to figure out how the ship works. And then you're going to be able to take on the Vulcans. <laughs> <laughs> and, and basically beat everybody down. It's like that. No, that is no, that's not going to happen. That's not going to play out that way. The, the, there's such a technology gap that would never, ever be able to happen. And then it just got into the whole thing of like, okay, so if like a butterfly flapping its wings, you know, overseas causes a hurricane on the other side of the world. If something like this had happened with Stephen Cochran, none of the original of the Star Trek Enterprise crew would have been together. Some of them may have not even been born. You know what I mean? It's like when you start to go down, like the, how the spider web of things would change history if that had happened. Mm -hmm. The idea that you'd have Phlox, Archer, Hoshi, Mayweather, Reed, you'd have all of the crew on the ship together is just stupid. And I was just sitting there. I could not disconnect my brain from like, okay, none of this makes any sense. It's kind of like watching the Marvel show, what if that was based on the comic book series, what if, right. where it takes like alternate, basically the same thing, but like, instead of Captain America being, you know, a guy, it's a woman. And, you know, instead of a man Hulk, it's a she Hulk. It's like playing around with what could be. Mm -hmm. I find those so much more interesting because it's still de dealing with the humanity of it, the heroic aspect of it. And it's still making you care about these characters in this small bite sized chunk. This episode, these two episodes did nothing to me to make me engage with anybody to like root for anybody. I'm just sitting there like letting it wash over me. And I couldn't disconnect from the logical loopholes that you could drive a cargo ship through. It was just uh, and the description we just described about them finding this old Kirk from like the, it's like, that's amazing. And what's funny is that's basically Star Trek Discovery, which we're about to get to. That kind of yeah. basically plays out in that show. So it's like, it's, they, I enjoyed that aspect of Discovery. And it's like to find out that they could have done that with Kirk on this. Holy cow. That would have been so much better than what we got. Because at least you have the real Enterprise crew that we know that you can connect with and then you can have the fun with the mirror universe and this evil Kirk and having an older Kirk, like we're dealing with, it's like, it would have been, it would have been a blast and it probably wouldn't have felt like such fan fiction of just, mm -hmm. oh, just a, a blank check. What if like, let's throw the logic out the window and let's just have fun. That's what the episode felt like to me. Like they didn't care about having logic. And for me, I just couldn't get past it. So I did not like this episode. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely on the opposite end of the spectrum from from you on this because while I wouldn't say I love this episode, I enjoyed it and mm. I wouldn't dissuade somebody from watching it. I think that oh, yeah. it makes an interesting it's almost like an interesting backdoor pilot to Discovery. And it's yeah. a pairing of episodes that I completely forgot about. And as I was watching it, I was like, wow, this really is remarkable that at the time they would have had no idea. They literally, while making this, were told your series has been canceled. They would have no idea about a show whose premise would be what Discovery season one was all about. Mm -hmm. And without putting too fine a point on it for anybody who hasn't watched Discovery, there's elements of this that will play out in that. 
I also, I'm a big sucker for well thought out fan fiction connections. I mm -hmm. like those moments. I myself like the idea that, um, in the Shatnerverse, the book has Spock at the grave site for mm -hmm. Kirk. That's the kind of thing that I imagine in my head canon. Like I come up with moments like that where I, for myself have imagined the moment when Picard would send a message to Spock saying, I know you think that he died alone. I mm -hmm. wanted to let you know he didn't, he was with me. That moment for me in my fan fiction head is one of my favorite moments. Never happened on screen, never had like, but it's mine. So the use of the defiant in this, I think mm -hmm. is really cool. I like this, uh, depiction of, yeah, all that stuff from the original series was a trap and they stole this ship into the past and they're here taking it apart and they're using, I liked the inclusion of like slave labor. I liked the inclusion of a Gorn as a slave master. Oh, I, yeah. I thought that the defiance escape scene when they are scrambling to get this gigantic ship working and they manage to get weapons so they can blow up the Tholians. And then as they're leaving, they blow the crap out of the station that they were just trapped in. I thought all that was really cool and exciting. And I liked the battle sequences showing how outmatched the enterprise era tech is by an original series level tech. That enter that defiant is tearing through the enterprise era craft with ease, literally pulling up behind Tellarite and Dorian Vulcan ships, blowing them out of the sky one after another without even trying really nobody well, on that bridge is sweating as they are attacking those ships and that as a premise for yeah, why would we stop and just hand this over to the emperor when I could be emperor because I'm now effectively more powerful than he is. I liked that as a story element. I liked the idea, as I mentioned before, and you had an issue with this very specific thing. I liked that it was a bottle episode without involvement from the original universe, because I felt like it would have felt shoehorned and the entire Shatner storyline of penal colony, like, like all that, that, that to me would have been one rung lower on the fan fiction hierarchy. <laughs> I felt like We're this as far as fan fiction was just like, yeah, you're not seeing the original well, characters and, and, a, but just to give you a sense of like you and I differ on this in my research, I discovered how the actors all had differing opinions about the value of this. And I'm just curious, let's play a little game. I'm going to give you actor names mm -hmm. and you tell me whether you think that they enjoyed this or they disliked it. Okay. So we'll start with Bacula. I think he didn't like it. We'll go with Blaylock. I think she probably did like it. Trainier trip. I'd probably say he liked it. Flox. He probably liked it. Reed. He probably liked it. Bacula liked it. Loved it. Okay. Oh, last one. I forgot to ask Hoshi. I don't think she liked it. These are her favorite episodes. Oh my God. Blaylock trip Flox. None of them liked it. The exact opposite of what I thought. Yeah. They thought it was just so much nonsense. That, that's whereas, my, that's what my, I'm, I, this whole episode was nonsense. It was whereas Archer, nonsensical. Bacula, and the actress who plays Hoshi, they have the most screen time. Yeah. And get to do the most scene shooing. And oh, Bacula is chewing scenery. He, he is chewing scenery like I've never seen anybody chew scenery. He is overacting. It is overacted. Like 12. Yeah. It's yeah. not going to 11. He's going to 12. Like, I could not, his whole, like the way he would just like thrust his chest out and like, he would do this like look on his face constantly. Like he was barely holding it together, which yeah. made sense when they started to show him hallucinating. 
but like the fat, the way he was chewing the scenery was. Yeah, so I'll go hysterical. back. I'll go back to the hallucinating in a moment. My take on that was they were being directed to act like they were on the original series. I think you're probably right because it felt the, it felt very very original. Yeah. The entire thing felt very original series. To it me. did feel very um, original series as far I, as the production quality and the acting and all that kind of stuff. And I I didn't have a problem with that. And I do want to make it clear there are scenes and sequences I thought were a lot of fun. There is, there is fun to be had in these episodes, but the problem was I had no emotional tie to it. And mm -hmm. maybe it's me looking back on it again, but like, you know, this is, this is the end of the series and it's like, why are you wasting your time on these two mm -hmm. nonsensical episodes when you could have had two episodes with the characters I do care about? It's like, what are you, what are you doing? And the fact, and the part of the reason I liked the idea of going the Kirk route was because it would have kept me in contact with the characters I actually do care about. So it's like, that's kind of my, my problem is that it was just these two bottle episodes that have nothing to do with anything. And it's just, it's so deep in the Star Trek lore that if you like, you're talking about the US to defiant was this trap and it was like t the way it was tied into the old episodes. If you're a casual Star Trek fan, you're lost. If you're even if you're, I'm a deep Star Trek fan and that I forgot about that. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, I'm watching this and I'm like, okay, it was just, it was just washing over me. So it was so deep into mm -hmm. the Star Trek lore that it's the hardest of hardcore people that have memories like steel traps that are going to make all these connections. And then for a more casual fan, it's just going to be like, what is happening right now? So it's, it, it, that's my problem with it. It, yep. it just went too, it went too deep. It went way too deep. Interesting note is in reference to like, why would they waste their time on this? If there had been a season five, Mm -hmm. Manny Cotto was planning a five episode arc that would have been a universe? standalone mini series within the mirror universe. He was planning on doing more of this as a standalone thing. And they okay, took the approach that they were looking at this as basically a viewer first contact with the mirror universe. One of the things about this that I like that the Shatner version would have, would not have allowed. I like the idea of this basically saying, yeah, the mirror universe has always existed. I like that element. Mm -hmm. And I like the elements that you point out or like the, the ones that made you say like only the hardest of the hardcore are going to remember that the defiant was in an episode, the Tholian web, like, like I like those moments. There's also, I'm curious about your take on the use of the CGI for the two major aliens depicted in this, the Gorn, the Gorn we have of mm -hmm. course seen before in the form mm -hmm. of a person in what looks like probably the world's hottest latex suit. <laughs> <laughs> and in this, it is complete CGI using motion capture and the Tholians okay. we have seen before in the form of a puppet head put in front of a screen so that you are just given what looks like a giant crystal with glowing eyes. In this, we are actually able to see more of the body and it has a sort of arachnid type form. I'm curious, how did you feel about the depiction of these two species in this way? Oh, I, I like them both. Like th this is actually one of my favorite parts of these two episodes. My favorite sequence was the Gorn stuff. I love the Gorn stuff. Now the special effects, not the greatest, like for the time and the budget they probably had perfectly fine. I, I cut it some slack, but like the whole sequence of the Gorn, like when he's on the, the, the radio talking to them and it's going to the translator and you still hear him going oh, 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 yeah. like his like, lizard gargles. Yeah. And he's just like, I love the depiction of that is so cool. Just this crazy lizard creature talking in his language into a translator and you're hearing a human voice come out the other end. Mm -hmm. I thought that was great and how it was outsmarting them. And like, it was like a little mini movie aliens yeah. <laughs> like right in the middle of the show. Yeah. It was a lot of fun because you know how dangerous, yeah. you, you know how dangerous the Gorn are. It just takes yeah. one Gorn to yeah. like really screw things up. And so I was like really enjoying that aspect of it. Yeah. And then the other side of it with the, the Tholians, the depiction of that, I was fine. Special effects, again, kind of cheap looking, but cut a little slack for the time and the budget. Yeah. I enjoyed it, especially with the whole like the, the, the sequence of the, the noise it's making to yeah. transmit using its, its, its exoskeleton its own to body like vibrate. creating the and, signal. Yeah. And the, yeah. And then way, and the, finally the way the doctor ends up killing it Yeah, <laughs> and how they're torturing it with the temperature, bringing it down. So it's getting too cold. I thought that that stuff was really, really cool and a lot of fun. So it's like, there is fun to be had in this, these episodes. 
it's just for me there just there's nothing that was fun throughout it was just like these like little bite size oh that was cool but that was a lot of fun mm -hmm. I, I wish i had more of the gorn i wish i had more of the tholians i wish i had more of those fun moments that i could connect with in some fashion other than just bacala chewing scenery and scantily clad hoshi throwing her body around yeah. it was to me that it was just like that for me was one of the hardest things to deal with was yeah. that how do you make somebody evil well if they're a man give them a beard if they yep. are the pilot of the enterprise give them an earring yep. if they are a woman give them a midriff i'm like and turn them into oh. a sex object i'm like okay this <laughs> yeah. is a little hard to sit through yes at moments but it's it's right it's cut right out of the original series playbook it is you know the original series you know we're already going to be dealing with mini skirts even in the main universe so yep like there's that and apparently back black uh bacula joked on the set what happened to the rest of jolene's skirt when she first appeared in the blue science officer uniform of an original series female so that her mini skirt is her uniform and that's saying something considering the outfits that she was wearing just as to paul on the enterprise yeah. were already like way too Spray tight and oversexed on. you know for <laughs> yeah. for yeah anybody to think of as a practical outfit but then you have the midriff stuff and i found it fascinating that the approach that the actress linda park when she was playing this evil version of hoshi asato she is taking the approach of like this is power in the form of medea so she was referencing like ancient greek storytelling of the powerful woman being seen because of male domination as being evil already in the form of woman and how does that woman take that and own it and make her her own power instead of saying like i have to fight against this as a vision of me i have to demonstrate that i'm stronger in other ways than this actually turning the male gaze against itself and from that perspective i think after i read that i had a different appreciation for the depiction of sato in this one mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. it ends with her basically declaring herself empress i thought that that was at first viewing kind of just like a dot 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 to the story but after mm -hmm. reading the actress's take on it i was like oh there's there is something there that's a little meatier and then to further see that they were planning on doing a five episode arc as a mini series within the series set in the mirror universe i think that they would have looked for more opportunities to develop that idea so mm -hmm. i think that there's some interesting stuff there i think that for the most part like you and i i think we both remain in the same place we started the conversation in which is you're not a fan i am a fan mm -hmm. i'm not a fan in the form of like oh this is the best which at the time was what a lot of reviewers were saying mm -hmm. but i am curious like if you were to if they were to do something more with this if in a season five there had been more mirror universe would you have gone into it willingly or would you have rolled your eyes gritted your teeth and said oh oh here we go i would have rolled my eyes and gritted my teeth because it's like i just found the logic of this just i couldn't get past it i also did not like the ending it makes so much more sense now though that they were playing a five episode arc in yeah. season five suddenly it's like okay that non-ending ending that they had the dot 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 it makes sense I think that was a mistake. They should have given the episode a little more of a satisfying conclusion, but leaving the door open for that the following season and the fact that it didn't, it didn't have a satisfying ending to me. Like it just kind of like, it just, I'm Empress. Oh, okay. Roll the credits. I, what, what is, wait, what? That was it. That was kind of the reaction I had yeah. uh, watching it. And that's not a good, always leave people wanting more <laughs> you know, show business. They did not leave me wanting more. It felt just like this womp womp kind of ending. Yeah. So I, I just, I just, to me, no, 
<laughs> I would have rolled my that's eyes. Why, if that's I why earlier I referred to it almost like a backdoor pilot. It felt very much like the start of something as opposed to a full contained thing. Which is why the ending was unsatisfying. Yeah. It was like, one, I wasn't enjoying my time in this universe. And then when it just kind of like, just kind of stopped. And then it was like, I know, oh, we're not doing this again, ever again. What was that about? It was yeah. kind of like my reaction of, geez. But now you've told me that they were planning more. It makes sense why they were doing that. But it just seems like a bad call. Like, I just feel like they just, as much as you say, you think that this was a really well thought out and, and constructed thing. I com- think the complete opposite. It feels like it was a hot mess. They had too many ideas. They had too many things they wanted to do. And they didn't focus on a more singular thread that they could pull on. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I can't, I just can't get, get on board with yeah. this stuff at all. <laughs> so I'm curious, listeners, viewers, what do you think? Do you fall into Matt's camp where you're just like, this couldn't end fast enough? Or did you fall into my camp where you had a good time and wouldn't put it at the top of the best of list, but would certainly include it as something that's fun to watch, especially if you're well steeped in original series lore? Let us know in the comments. Next time, we're going to be talking about demons. Also, ironically, we've been talking about the episode from Enterprise called Demons. <laughs> Before we sign off, Matt, do you have anything you want to talk about? What do you have going on on your main channel? We have a couple of videos coming up that I'm pretty excited about, about new plastic eating bacteria. I run. I also have a video coming up about the top five home batteries I think people should consider if they're looking to get energy storage for their homes with some new cool tech that's going to be coming. Check those out. Sounds really interesting. And it reminds me that if that plastic eating bacteria comes to fruition, I'm going to have to figure out some other container than the plastic container I keep my bacteria in. <laughs> As for me, if you have any interest in finding out more about my books, you can go to seanfarrell.com. Look for my books there. You can also just go directly to whatever bookseller you enjoy. That includes everything from your local bookstore or library to Amazon or Barnes and Noble. You should be able to find them all there. And my new book, The Sinister Secrets of Singe, is available for pre-order now. And if you are looking for a place to buy that, you can go to my website. There's a link right there that you can jump to to do a pre-order. If you'd like to support the show, please consider reviewing us on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever it was you found this. Go back there, leave a review, subscribe, share it with your friends. And if you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show, click on the Become a Supporter button. It allows you to throw coins at us. The welts, yes, they hurt, but we also appreciate them. They're a reminder that you like us. Dare I say even love us? Hmm. (laughs) And when you support us in that way, it also gets you automatically subscribed to Out of Time, our spinoff show, which is available for you ensigns who are direct supporters. And on Out of Time, Matt and I talk about anything that passes our fancy. In other words, we might talk about other Star Trek. We might talk about Star Wars. We might talk about films, movies, books, comics, video games, whatever it is that we're currently enjoying and we hope you will check it out all of those are great ways to support the show thank you so much everybody for listening or watching and we'll talk to you next time 